Feel free to check out my tea public after the video. Devil Man is a popular 1972 horror series by famous manga author and artist Go Nagai, who is also known for other classics like Cutie Honey and Mazinger Z. The manga followed a young man named Akira Fudo, who one night gains the ability to transform into the demonic superhero Devil Man, who goes to war with demons in our world. The Devil Man manga was a huge deal at the time. It was a series published in Weekly Shonen Jump that gradually became darker as it progressed and delved deeper into themes of anti-war and the lesser of two evils, which resulted in some controversy due to its horrifically graphic nature. It was chilling, depressing, tragic, grotesque, and overall iconic, which in turn made it one of the most influential manga ever made. And we also have to thank Glenn Danzig for making it popular in the manga community in the US. There was an anime that ran at the same time as the manga, several OVAs, spin-offs, crossovers, Supercharger Heaven by White Zombie, and more. This also includes a 2004 live-action film from Toei, directed by Hiroyuki Nasu, who at the time was only known for his numerous live-action adaptations of Bebop High School that earned him a reward for Best Director at the 8th Yokohama Film Festival. When word of a live-action Devilman film came out, fans were very excited. However, as more information about the film was being revealed, that excitement turned into fear, which would then turn into anger. Upon the release of the first trailer, fans flooded the movie's official website with hate comments that ended up delaying the movie for half a year. Well, that sounds familiar. And it doesn't stop there. No, 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 no. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. Buckle up, ladies and gentlemen. Grab a Bible, get some incense burning, put your crosses up, get some wafers and wine, and have some holy water ready, because I will show you what is perhaps the absolute worst live-action anime and manga adaptation of all time. Yes, worse than Death Note 2017, worse than Fist of the North Star, and goddammit, it's even worse than Dragon Ball Evolution. Attack on Titan looks like the Seven Samurai compared to this godforsaken movie. What's that? Ghost in the Shell? Get out of here. Oh yeah, spoilers for both this movie and the manga because the movie tries to cram the entire story, consisting of five volumes, now two, covering 16 chapters, which in total makes up about 1,330 pages worth of material, all within two hours. And we all know how that usually turns out. Our tragic tale opens with a young Akira Fudo and Ryo Asuka, who for some reason has white hair, as they look through the Book of Foreshadowing. When all of a sudden... Oh cool, guess I'm watching X-Men now. Oh you motherfu- We then fast forward to see Akira and Ryo, played by twin J-pop performers Hisato and Yusuke Izaki, making their first film appearances here. And together they make Japanese knockoff Peter Parker and Harry Osborn. Also, is it me or are pop singers taking lead roles in live action anime starting to become a trend? Although to this movie's credit, it did somewhat inspire the use of track in Devilman Crybaby. That's the only good thing I'll say about this movie. Also, something tells me that these two weren't casted for their acting capabilities. Akira and Ryo meet up with Ayana Sekai as Miki Makimura, whose family took Akira in after his parents died in a car crash. We later see the rest of her family and oh hey look, it's Admiral Tachibana from GMK! Akira gets in trouble with some bullies, and they beat the crap out of him so hard that they forget to add punch sound effects in some of those blows at the air. <laughs> What makes you think that? The fact that you're benching 65 pounds? No, don't run away! She was totally miring ya, bro! Ryo tells Akira that his father died and gives him a headset that plays a video of his father explaining what's been going on with his research. Turns out his team discovered an energy source that released a monster shaped like sperm cells? Ew, am I even allowed to show this without getting demonetized? Basically, this energy source blew its load all over the research team, turning the people into demons. And damn it, old man, could you please move back a few steps? You're really making me uncomfortable. Ryo takes Akira to his home and...
Why? After death, Ryo's dad gives Akira a money shot from the grave. Now Akira has become Devil Man, and Oh my god! Good lord, the CGI is so bad. I'd make a joke about how it looks like a video game cutscene, but video games look way better than this. Okay, I know it was 2004 and Japan didn't really have the budget for good CGI, which begs the question, why even use CGI in the first place? Yeah, sure, you have a giant blob of a horrifying NPC, but they easily could have had Devil Man be a stunt actor in makeup. That's not what I meant! Akira wakes up the next morning to find out that not only does his hoodie disappear between shots, he finds out that he really is Discount Toby Maguire. All of a sudden, Ryo has been confronted by Akira's bullies from earlier, and Akira arrives at the scene just in time to take him down with his newfound powers of wire work and slapping. <laughs> See, Akira? I told you she was Myron, ya. Yeah? After that, Akira became so full of himself that he started wearing shirts with his first initial on them. Okay, I know it's a reference to the original anime where he wears the same thing. Anyway, ask and ye shall receive, Akira, because if you want to fight, you got it. We're then introduced to Cyrene, whose outfit looks like it was purchased from a Halloween store, rather than having someone actually make a costume for her. That is, if you would call it that. And again, fight choreography is just so convincing. After a visually nauseating CGI fight scene, Ryo comes in just in time and... It ends? The scene just ends right there? Hey Miki, I know we're family and all, but technically we're not related, so... And according to a newscaster played by pro wrestler Bob Sapp of all people, we then see that more demons are starting to pop up. This then leads to the fight against the turtle demon Jinmen. In the manga OVAs and especially Crybaby, this was a very powerful confrontation as Jinmen traps the souls of his victims into his shell with only their faces intact. This creates something similar to a hostage situation but the only way to free the victims is to put them out of their misery. This result tells Akira that even as Devil Man, he cannot save all of humanity, and that people will die in the process. How does the movie handle that, you may ask? <laughs> Akira just kills him without a second thought. Our hero, ladies and gentlemen. Also, you know your effects are bad if they look like young Gary. After Akira learns absolutely nothing from that confrontation, there are news that demons are appearing in other countries around the world. And would you please take care of your lips, Akira? No one needs to know that you've been going to town with your surrogate sister. We start to see more demons appearing via news broadcast and... Well, what did you think was going to happen? This gradually throws the entire world into chaos, up to the point where innocent people are being murdered, even with the slightest suspicion of being a demon. And in good old Stan Lee fashion, Devil Man creator Go Nagai makes a cameo in this film. That there is the face of a disappointed man. And here is perhaps the best worst scene in any live action anime and manga adaptation. A demon's nest is found in this mansion that Akira and Ryo go to. Demons start flooding out of the mansion and all get shot down, which looks like a scene from Brudemic. And it is this moment where it is revealed that Ryo is actually Satan. Oh my God. I'll go more on that later. Ryo, who is a Kimboing Uzi, starts going full Christian Bale in equilibrium on these soldiers in the most ridiculous laugh out loud way possible. And it doesn't stop there. Ryo enters the mansion, and this happens. I have some things to address here. One, how come these soldiers don't start shooting at Ryo? He's leaving himself wide open in front of all of them. Two, Ryo had numerous ways he could have shot these guys, but he chooses the most careless way possible. What is his strategy here? Three, 
Out of all people, why did the filmmakers decide that this laughably exaggerated plump fellow would be the one to walk out of the mansion, shout long live the demons, and die right on the spot in the most comedic manner? 4. How could anyone take any of this seriously? And 5. Why would you put perhaps the biggest twist in the entire manga in the worst scene possible? Okay, up until now, I've hidden the fact that the movie actually spoils this early on. Earlier in the film, after Ryo shows Akira what happened to his father, he tells him that he's also become a demon, and begs Akira to kill him. When Akira transformed into Devil Man, so did Ryo. Throughout the movie, it makes Ryo out to be this psychotic and unstable person. Ryo even says in the movie that he is pure evil. So if you take that and pair it with when he confirmed that he is a demon, it makes this twist entirely meaningless. The twist hardly has any effect on the movie whatsoever because they already told you that he is Satan. Now, let me rephrase myself. Ryo turning out to be Satan was perhaps the biggest plot point in the entire manga. It creates a huge impact on the story and its characters. Akira has been best friends with a man who turned out to be the epitome of all evil, and the one who's been pulling the strings the entire time. Ryo, now Satan, is the very reason why Akira has lost everyone he has loved. This twist, along with the very graphic visuals in the manga and its themes around it, are at the very center of its popularity and why Devil Man as a manga was very influential in the first place. Here, the movie is so poorly written and directed up to this point that, again, the twist hardly even matters. Why even try to adapt the most pivotal moment of the series, which is also one of the biggest moments in all of classic shonen manga when you can't even do it? Did no one take this movie seriously? So yeah, everything, including the movie itself, goes to shit. Ah! Which slowly builds up to the most shocking event from the series, the deaths of the Makimura family. The Makimuras are suspected of being demons, which leads to a bloodthirsty mob of insane people killing them all, Miki included. This was a very shocking moment because over time we've grown to love Miki as a character and she had good chemistry with Akira. She also represented Akira's happiness as she was the only thing in his life he lived for because she has done so much for him. And before his eyes, all that is left of Akira's humanity and happiness is stripped away from him. Let's see how the movie does it. After mourning the death of the Makimuras, Akira and Ryo meet again. The last 20 minutes of the film is nothing but two terribly animated and rendered CGI monsters battling it out to the death. Along with very little practical effects work, that just end up being wasted. The world is destroyed, all life on Earth is decimated, the moon is cracked in half for some reason, and Akira and Ryo rest upon a rock. This is one of the worst movies I've ever ever seen in my entire life. The acting is so wooden and monotone, everyone in this movie sounds and looks bored out of their minds, 
the cinematography is bland and uninteresting, the scoring is so forgettable, the sound design is just ugly and horrendous, the pacing is too fast, which makes the movie feel really slow, the tone is inconsistent beyond all comprehension, the direction is a complete and competent utter mess, the writing tries so hard to be a tragic story about anti-war and the lesser of two evils, and completely botches it, making it awkward and corny as hell. I didn't even mention that there's an entire subplot about the character Miko and this one kid. How come I never talked about it, you may ask? Because it serves zero purpose to the story whatsoever. It's just slapped in there for the sake of padding out the runtime. Oh yeah, and somehow, they survived towards the end of the movie, even though they should clearly be dead. The special effects. Good. God. The special effects alone are enough to prevent anyone from watching this movie. And how on earth did this fucking movie get rewarded for best special effects? Half of everything is on a green screen. Sometimes, things are green screened over things that are already green screened. And other times, there's green screen in places that shouldn't even have green screen. Everything else, effects-wise, is a putrid pigsty of CGI that may as well be cutscenes for a really, really bad video game. And the same sets are reused over and over and over, and the action is so unconvincing and nauseating to the point where they're so visually noisy that you can hardly even make out what's happening, and it gives you a headache! Now allow me to make a case for other live-action adaptations that are greatly reviled and disregarded. Ghost in the Shell. Despite it removing the philosophical themes of the original 1995 film, it's a nice little sci-fi action flick. The sets and overall aesthetic are crafted rather well, and Scarlett Johansson does pull off a good Motoko Kusanagi. Also, the 1995 version hardly even followed the manga, so there's that. Attack on Titan. The filmmakers behind these two films were actually pretty smart. They gave Hajime Isayama as much creative freedom as he wanted, and they were done in tokusatsu like the movies that inspired Attack on Titan, such as War of the Gargantuas and Godzilla vs. Bailante. Both Attack on Titan films actually do have some importance, as they did end up influencing future moments in the manga. Other than that, it's well shot, well paced, could use a little more development, but they're not too bad. Death Note 2017. If you take away all the bad acting, writing, and pacing, the movie is edited, shot, and directed just fine. And although this is more of a personal taste thing, I honestly really like the soundtrack, even if some of its usage is a little odd. And Ryuk is definitely the best part. Fist of the North Star. There really wasn't a whole lot to adapt before this came out. There was a 1986 animated film that rearranged events from the manga and tells an incomplete story, as well as an English translation of the manga that only covered the first arc. And this is stuff not a lot of people were aware of at the time, too. The movie almost works, but it just doesn't. I mean, if it were made now, I guarantee you that it would be so much better. And finally, Dragon Ball Evolution. There is no saving this movie. There's nothing good about it. But the one thing it has over Devilman is creativity. I would honestly rather have a movie that tries to be original rather than try to become something it's not. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention. This movie's budget was 5.2 billion yen, which at the time translates to about 36.3 million dollars, and when you adjust it for inflation, it's about 49.2 million dollars. To give you an idea of how much that is, let's compare that to another special effects heavy live action project. Attack on Titan's budget was about 3 billion yen, which translates to about 26.3 million dollars, which adjusted for inflation is about 28.4 million dollars. Also, keep in mind, this is for two movies, meaning each one is 1.5 billion yen, which translates to about 13.2 million dollars, which ends up being 14.2 million dollars for each movie. Devilman's budget is the equivalent to almost four Attack on Titan movies. Not to mention, that's about the same budget as Death Note 2017, 
even more than Dragon Ball Evolution, nearly five times as much as Fists of the North Star, and around ten times as much as Giver. Devilman is a movie with no heart, no soul, nothing. It lacks everything that made the original story so compelling and iconic, and its greatest moments are severely watered down and have very little impact due to how poorly the film is written and directed. Devilman was dead on arrival. Oh, and you want to talk about death for a moment? Devilman is so bad that people actually mourn the fact that it was made every year on its anniversary, October 9th, with 2019 marking its 15th. A movie magazine published a list of filmmakers they wanted to die, and director Hiroyuki Nasu was at the top for directing Devilman. Sure, it was all a joke, but Nasu actually died of liver cancer months after the film's release. This movie is cursed. It's almost as if the movie itself is a demon, plaguing any movie shelf with evil. Not only was Devilman voted the worst Japanese film of 2004, it was actually voted as the worst Japanese movie of the entire decade. Funny how this atrocity of a manga adaptation was released the same year as Catwoman. And you know what? This movie is so bad that I would honestly urge you all to watch it on your own when possible. Its shitty, laughable, and unholy nature is enough for it to be quite the experience. And if you want to have a really good laugh, watch the English dub on the Tokyo Shock DVD. It's not ADV Ghost Stories levels of bizarre and atrocious, but it's definitely more entertaining than the OVA's English dub in terms of so bad it's good. What is that? What the hell is that? This is crazy, Rido. I'm not gonna do it, dude! Happy birthday. Also, the fact that they even gave this movie a special edition is hilarious. In the end, whenever a new live-action adaptation of a popular manga and or anime is in the works, you won't have much to fear. Why? Because nothing, nothing will ever compare to Devilman, the worst live-action manga and anime adaptation of all time. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you've made it this far, it truly means a lot. And if you like what you see, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. That and you can also go ahead and give this video a like to show your support. You can share it with your friends and family if you think they'll get a good kick out of it. And of course, leave a comment and share your thoughts. And in the words of Bill Morrison of Channel 12 News, <laughs> Our time has come! <laughs> Goodbye, everyone!